From the CISO series, it's Cybersecurity Headlines. Elon finally buys Twitter. Russia warns West about commercial satellites. Industrial ransomware attacks on the rise in North America. These are some of the stories that my colleagues and I have been bringing to you on this week's Cybersecurity Headlines. And now we get a chance for some insight, opinion, and expertise on these stories from our returning guest, Will Gregorian, former Senior Director, Technology and Operations and Security at Rhino. Will, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining us. Hi, Sean. How are you? Happy Friday. Well, a nice shirt, by the way. Nice, uh, nice, nice fleece. I have to represent. <laughs> <laughs> Our sponsor for today is Votero. Prevent and identify UFOs with Votero Cloud. Join us on YouTube Live. Go to CISOseries.com. Hit the events drop down and look for the cybersecurity headlines. We can review image. It's the third one down. Just click on it to join us. But we're not going to wait for you. We just have 20 minutes today. So let's dive right in. So obviously the big headline, Elon Musk finally buys Twitter. Last night, Elon Musk closed out his $44 billion deal to buy Twitter and began cleaning house with at least four top Twitter executives, including the CEO and chief financial officer, being fired. The deal sets Twitter on an uncertain course, with Musk describing, describing himself as a free speech absolute, absolutist. Excuse me. Twitter stock has been delisted as the company has become privately owned by Musk's company, X Holdings. His goal, he said, is to make Twitter an everything app possibly similar to China's WeChat. So a lot to unpack here, Will, for sure. Um, undoubtedly, the story of the week, if not the year, and many people will be likely, likely focusing on the political implications, especially could Donald Trump be reinstated uh, before midterms. But I'd like to focus on the security and privacy implications on the platform you know, what, what are your thoughts? Anything you'd like to share? What, what are your initial reactions? The, so I've been observing initial reactions is that there is a trove of information security practitioners, including one of the hosts for the CISO series, leaving Twitter. So that's not good. Um, the second part to that is that I'm hearing a lot about people deleting their DMs, um, obviously taking ops and the fact that, you know, there is going to be a lapse of privacy and really... I'm worried about the fact that the Twitter InfoSec community is going to go away. I'm the most concerned about that part because that's where you get a lot of information about zero days. That is a super that is a super interesting uh, spin on that one I, ha I hadn't thought of. Um, I mean, I, I'm looking at forward to getting my popcorn, but there could be real implications, real impacts to our industry um, in, a ne in a negative way. So, hundred um, percent agree. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what about, what about the? There, oh, go ahead. You. you Go ahead. Sorry. I, I think you were going to ask me about Trump's return, weren't you? <laughs> I wasn't. No, but if you want to offer anything there, feel free and watch me cringe. <laughs> it's going to happen. Brace yourselves. But that's what's going to generate ad revenue. Also, congrats to, uh, to Prague. He made a lot of money off of this and the shareholders. So there wasn't a successful exit here at the end of the day. But it is at the end of the day, capitalism and it is all about the money. Yes, whatever whatever will make headlines and drive more uh, viewership uh, for sure. I was I was wondering about potentially the the uh, return of of Mudge uh, to to the uh, the company. Any any thoughts on on that? It's just so fun to speculate. I don't know. I don't think so. I think Mudge did what he needed to do. <laughs> he, he is often the ethics canary, so his job here is done. Uh, <clears throat> there's a prominent Twitter handle, Chet Dorn or Dorn or whatever it is. It's a parody account. He can be the CISO for Twitter moving on. It's also fun to speculate. An accidental CISO, thanks for the uh, note here, hoping that it's teeth gnashing of anything right now. That won't change as much as people think it will, or at least that it won't change too quickly. So we'll uh, sit back and watch that one unfold for sure. Yeah. Hi, accidental CISO. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on to the next story. Uh, NSA cyber chief says Ukraine war is prompting more intelligence sharing. Rob Joyce, director of the NSA Cybersecurity Directorate, speaking Wednesday at the Trellick Cybersecurity Summit, said that rapidly and proactively sharing intelligence on cyber threats with industry and critical infrastructure providers can really make a big difference and, de and decisive difference, adding that this was one of the main lessons learned from the ongoing war in Ukraine. Stressing the need for greater knowledge sharing, despite the competitive nature of business, is possible and necessary for mutual benefit and safety. We can make available the insights with what we know without putting at risk how we know it, he said. So um, great 
spin here, uh, Intel sharing on businesses that are essentially competing with one another. Um, definitely a situation where collective um, good overrides the spirit of competition. What are your thoughts on, on Mr. Joyce's comments here? 100% agree with Mr. Joyce. Um, <clears throat> Rob is actually a very good uh, Twitter um, user. He tends to post a lot of memes about cybersecurity. Um, I There is a part of me that kind of wishes that he would actually post threat intel information, given the fact that he is probably sitting on the mountain of it. But I do think like, you know, and it's very interesting that I, I had a conversation just recently, not too long ago about threat intel feeds and sharing. And a lot of the smaller, smaller businesses, they can't afford the exorbitant cost of threat intel uh, feeds as well as uh, data sharing. So it would be good for the government agencies to be able to start doing that. Um, it is altruistic, it is competitive, but it's necessary if we're going to really like, solve problems here. Yeah. I, I agree. And do you think there's, I mean, is there an element where companies could be sharing more and you think they're just genuinely afraid to have that attribution back to them or that they'd be tipping their hand to to anybody? What, what's that just... fear? I mean, you know, the cybersecurity industry talks about uh, fear, uncertainty and doubt and not having to subscribe to that. But at the same time, we're doing the same thing. So step up. <laughs> it's hypocritical, right? Okay. It is. <laughs> Agree. All right, let's move on to our next story. Uh, Russia warns the West that they can target commercial satellites. This warning comes from senior Russian foreign ministry official Konstantin Vorontsov from Russia's foreign ministry while speaking to the United Nations. He stated that commercial satellites from the U.S. and its allies could become legitimate targets for Russia if they were involved in the war in Ukraine. Bronsoff did not mention any specific satellite companies, though one could speculate a reference to SpaceX, which pledged to continue funding its Starlink internet service in Ukraine. Um, so a lot a lot to uh, sort of look at here with the infrastructure, how, are, how services are delivered. Um, in, in wartime, there's a lot of saber rattling, but there's no question that something like this could have a, a major impact. So what, what's your thought here? Russia has been doing this quite a bit, haven't they? First, it was nuclear weapons. Now it's uh, obviously, you know, uh, targeting the commercial entities and what have you. It does feel like it is a direct response to SpaceX's response around the coverage. <clears throat> Whether they choose to do anything about it is really up in the air. And so far, they haven't actually like you know proven anything other than just vague and empty threads. And one would hope that that remains to be the case. We don't want World War III. Um, however, if it does happen, I think that the U.S. will have to like step up from a uh, uh, from a I guess response perspective. <laughs> Unless Musk wants to go buy Ukraine, maybe that's on his list. <laughs> it could be. It could be. And and Dave Cross um, came in with a comment, brought up a really good point about physical or cyber attacks against side, satellites. So one might have, you know, gravitated towards one or the other. I mean, I was thinking uh, that there could be some f physical attacks, and we saw like undersea cables becoming a a, a more of a vulnerability. Um, raining in data centers is still is, is happening. So just you forget that everything we do online is still part of the physical world somewhere. So what, what's your thought on, on the physical versus cyber aspect here? At the physical level, <clears throat> you know, this, this really like, you know, reminded me of Star Wars program back in the 80s when Reagan started the whole thing. So the old feels new all of a sudden. Um, at the, I, I do think that, you know, Russians obviously have proven themselves to be good adversaries when it comes to the cyber threats. So maybe that's where it starts. But certainly I feel like, you know, they're kind of running desperate. So who knows? Maybe they they'll um, switch over to kinetic warfare. Um, clearly, like you know, they have an agenda that they're pushing here. Yeah, definitely. It, it'll be interesting to watch as as technology progresses. Um, wars are fought on different fronts for sure. So yeah, um, we'll move on to the next story. Industrial, excuse me, industrial ransomware attacks rise in North America. According to a new uh, excuse me, analysis by Dragos, in Q3, 36% of all industrial ransomware cases occurred at North American organizations, up from 25% in Q2. Globally, the rate of attacks remained virtually flat, with a total of 128 incidents in the quarter, up just 2.4%. The manufacturing se sector undoubtedly remains a popular target for industrial ransomware. Metal production and food and beverage sectors were most commonly hit. Lockbit operated more than a third of all of these attacks, while Ragnar Locker Group was observed specifically targeting the energy sector. So obviously, um, the energy sector um, remains a prime target. That's one one takeaway I would think here. Uh, what do you think about the rise in, in North America? Does that say something for 
you know, the defense is weakening or um, becoming more of a target and just the volume in general, uh, anything that you want to call out here? It's tough um, given the fact that I'm not close enough to it, but my take on the whole situation is like, you know, if it has remained relatively the same numbers, there's good news there that, you know, our defenses are still working. North America has always been a target, let's face it. Um, there, there is like something to be said about the fact that maybe um, the companies that are being attacked haven't necessarily like invested correctly in their cybersecurity posture. And maybe that's the reason why they're, they're continuing to be attacked. So that might be largely because like, you know, again, like, you know, margins are tight. Profits um, need to basically be like, they have shareholders to like, you know, behold into, you know, profits need to be basically described, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, um, we're struggling. We're going to continue to struggle. <laughs> <laughs> well said. Um, 128 incidents in a quarter uh, globally. Any, any? Does that strike you one way or the other as a, a yawn, or do you think you know a number? That it's a big world. <laughs> it's a big world. So 128, relatively speaking, is um, it's still a small amount, though it still shouldn't happen. But let's face it, like, you know, if it does happen, I would be more interested in understanding, like, you know, what the response rate was and what happened really more than the actual like numbers that did occur. So what I want to know is like uh, the deeper dive into the 128 and how quickly they were able to respond to it, what their process looked like and um, what they what sort of damage they were able to mitigate. Agreed. Agreed. Let's move on and spend a moment with our sponsor, uh, Votero. UFOs are everywhere. They're in your applications, cloud storage, endpoints, and emails. That's right, UFOs, unidentified file objects, are hiding in files across your organization. UFOs can contain malware that exfiltrates data or deploys ransomware, and 70% of UFOs can't be detected by traditional scanning solutions like antivirus and sandboxing. That's why our, that's where Vitero comes in. Vitero prevents UFOs before they hitch a ride in on files without detection and without slowing down business. Do you believe? Learn more at votero.com slash UFOs. That's V-O-T-I-R-O dot com slash UFOs. All right. On the uh, on to the next story. Exploited Windows Zero Day bypasses Mark of the Web security warnings. Windows includes a security feature called Mark of the Web that flags a file as having been downloaded from the internet and therefore should be treated with caution. The MOTW flag is added to a downloaded file or email attachment as a special alternate data stream called zone.identifier, which uses JavaScript and generates a warn, warning pop-up window. HP's Threat Intel team recently reported that threat actors are infecting devices with Magnabur ransomware using the JavaScript to bypass the warning window and deliver malware. So question, Will, story appears another example of a piece of code set up to add security, but then being used by the bad actors to bypass it. <laughs> so, uh, And Bleeping Computer says that this has already been seen in ransomware attacks. So how do you feel about the level of urgency with this one? Um, urgent, but also not urgent. So if you read the article, it does talk about the fact that Windows 8.1, if you're still on it, don't upgrade to 10, upgrade to 11, um, does behave correctly. It seems like you know this was introduced in Windows 10. So no good deed goes unpunished, so to speak. Um, it seems like Windows 11 does behave correctly, although if you open the, the payload from a zip file, it tends to basically work the way it's intended. So maybe there is some risk there. From an urgency perspective, yeah, um, it was a feature that was introduced in 10. It sort of worked, but it didn't quite work. And now we have to fix it. Um, it does kind of beg the question. Um, if you're going to introduce a feature, why not you know introduce it to the hacker community? <laughs> <laughs> Start there. Let them <laughs> knock it. <laughs> Let them break it first before you release to the masses. Maybe that's one way of doing it. I no, don't know. I, and I think that's happening more, right? I think that that it people is. are starting to invite people in, you know, with these hack hackathons and bug bounties. Yep. It feels like we are evolving more to that direction, but probably some more uh, work work to be done there. But every time a new feature is released or a new OS or any new tech, I always am thinking, oh, there's new zero days uh, waiting to be found. And maybe that's an <laughs> over pessimistic view. But I mean, it's true, right? These things are, it's not like they just appear one day, they're just discovered. And um, I don't know that we'll ever get to 
you'll fully we will. address yeah, Perfection is an enemy of good. I actually think, uh, you know, it was interesting. It was like, you know, uh, by the way, uh, Will, who is the security researcher, um, they, they did their analyses. And I really like their name, I have to say. Um, when, when they were going through it, obviously, like, you know, they spent a copious amount of time researching it and analyzing it. it you know, broken signatures galore. That's how it, what it became to be what it is now. Um, but yeah, I, I do agree that there needs to be a better participation from a community aspect with bug bounties and what have you. Ultimately, that's really like the best way to sort of like, you know, discover some of these, what I would consider to be lower level, but highly important and urgent, uh, you know, fixes. So maybe it is urgent. Maybe I'll take that back. <laughs> <laughs> we uh we got to the other side um so uh, <laughs> there you go. Piso, uh called out a yolo and david cross uh asked who's upgrading to windows 11 uh, for the chat um so that is oh those are david all good, all good questions <laughs> you, you know you know the answer to that question there's probably an it and information security team at some conglomerate and a fortune one that's sitting there and analyzing windows 11 before they allow the upgrade which will happen 10 years from now <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you have it. <laughs> Thank you for the insight there. All right. Moving on to the next story. Uh, Pete, this is one of my favorites. Uh, Pizza123 password takes momentum out of Fast Company. The breach of Fast Company last month in late September was achieved by exploiting an easily guessed default password, Pizza123. That's right. The password had been used across a dozen word press accounts, according to the hacker, who goes by the name of Thrax and who described the attack as ridiculously easy in an article published on fastcompany.com. The hackers claimed to have used the vulnerable uh, password to access authentication tokens, Apple News API keys, and Amazon simple email service tokens. They went on to push offensive notifications to the home screens of subscribers to the Fast Company channel on the Apple News service. So, hmm, what could be the takeaway here on this one, Will? Use a password manager. Don't put all eggs in one basket. Maybe don't use a repeatable password. I mean, how many times do I have to say this? Also, WordPress is the gift that keeps on giving. Let's not dismiss that part. Um, you know, this actually, you know, it's um, it's super interesting. I mean, like, you know, it doesn't matter how many times we say this ad nauseum. It seems like, you know, nobody wants to pay attention. Um, it is fascinating that someone was able to generate a password called pizza123. How does that happen? How does that happen? Even WordPress has some mechanisms for that. So yeah, like you had to go out of your way to really do that. Um, it's unfortunate. <laughs> and and I think um, you know another question here is it's not just you know user level accounts. It's you know admin uh, you know creds. So you know it, it, we have to start you know, walking the walk. I don't think there's anything new. It's definitely a head beater uh, type of a story that we have here, but you know, when, when it's on the highest privileged accounts, you know, that says something for company culture, in my opinion. That it does. Uh, you're right. I, th th there was a reason why I opened up with uh, use a password manager. Um, <clears throat> I don't know enough about fast company and I tend not to knock my peers either in it and or security just because we all have a very difficult job. We don't know the circumstances, but it does feel like a failure on several fronts on that, uh, on their part, not necessarily the IT practitioners. I'm going to guess that, you know, they probably don't have enough resources to be able to address these things. But it, at the end of the day, it's, it bottoms down to security awareness matters. And how can we get people to understand that? So <laughs> that's a story for uh, <laughs> the next time. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's, let's move on to our next story. Uh, CISOs struggle to articulate business impacts of cyber risks. According to a new survey from FTI Consulting, 85% of U.S. CISOs indicated that cybersecurity has gained prominence on the board's agenda over the past 12 months. Additionally, 79% of CISOs feel heightened scrutiny from senior leadership. Unfortunately, 53% say their cybersecurity priorities are not completely aligned with C-suite leadership. Further, 58% of CISOs indicated they struggle to communicate technical information and cyber risk in a manner that the board and senior leadership can understand. A couple of other notes here are notable findings where 82% of CISOs feeling that they need to exaggerate their role to the board, while 46% of CISOs who experienced a cyber incident struggled to rebuild trust with leadership afterward. So a ton of great stuff here to unpack, some that's been around uh, maybe for, for a while. Uh, but what's your take on this one, Will? 
<clears throat> so good news. Um, at least the numbers are increasing from a visibility perspective. So good for all the CISOs that are struggling to articulate, you know, their import their role, the importance of their role, their efficacy when their program to the board of directors. Um, I, of that 85%, I'm not really sure if I fully understood whether that 85% covered like, you know, private companies like startups, what have you, the whole nine yards. And I care deeply about that part. I think like, you know, the uh, publicly traded companies and their CISOs, they're in a better position. They're definitely more valued from a sort of like, you know, cybersecurity perspective. Um, but yeah, like it, it still feels good, but there is still that articulation of, tech to business speak, which most CISOs don't know how to do because the current regime and the current you know, class of CISOs that are out there, they've risen through the ranks. They're IT practitioners, they're security practitioners, they're not necessarily your MBA. So we're still struggling with the business speak and that's gonna continue for at least another decade before it, became, it gets better. But there is good news. At least they're being acknowledged in the room. <laughs> Agreed. It, it is nice that it's uh, in, in, increasing. I don't know that there's much of a choice with all of the the attacks that are happening having real real world co consequences and impacts. I don't know that there's a chance there, but um, you know, it, it it it's a problem that that's been there at least the 20 years I've I've been in security. Yep. Is you know translating technical terms in, in terms of why the business would care, and we just need to spend more time probably in the rooms uh, with them to help help. Uh, better understand their language as well. Yeah, uh, and there is a reason why BSOS exists. There is a reason why chiefs of uh, staff exist. Um, I think we just need more practice. That's really what it boils down to. Perfect. Well, the 20 minutes flew by uh, today. Uh, so question for you, Will. Um, any thumbs up or eye roller stories uh, for, of the ones that we covered? Uh, I mean, yeah, pizza one, two, three takes the cake. <laughs> <laughs> I, no matter what, let, let's have some levity here in the, on Friday. But yeah, like, um, I, I think like, you know, it's always uh, amusing when you see like silly passwords like that becoming the Achilles heel for an organization. <laughs> it is pizza Friday, but don't change your password to pizza one, two, three. That's that right. Is a public service announcement. All right. Well, thank you to Will Gregorian, former senior director, technology operations and security at Rhino. Thank you also to our sponsor, Votero, prevent and identify UFOs with Votero Cloud. A reminder to join us next week for Super Cyber Friday. Our topic of discussion will be hacking DDoS trends, an hour of critical thinking about emerging threats in distributed denial of service attacks. That will be followed by the Week in Review show, which is this one. And in the meantime, you can still get your daily news fix through cybersecurity headlines every day, just six minutes. And now you can also subscribe to the show via the newsletter on LinkedIn. There you can read and or hear the show. Just go to the CISO series page on LinkedIn to subscribe. Until next week, I'm Sean Kelly reporting for the CISO series. Cybersecurity headlines are available every weekday. Head to CISOseries.com for the full stories behind the headlines.